What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Pixels Podcast, podcast about all the nerdy things we love and enjoy. As always, we're your hosts. That's that's Blake. I'm Will. Today, we're here to talk a little Critical Role, a little D and D B and B. Haven't thrown that one out in a while. It felt like it. it felt like the it's right moment like, to bring it back. It's been like two weeks that we haven't said <laughs> it. <laughs> it's you know been what? I think it's been a little longer than that, but you know, <laughs> not too long. Uh, how are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. It feels even it feels like a monday even though it's wednesday so yeah, yeah take that not, as you will but yeah, you not know, in a good way yeah yeah <laughs> not in a good way but I, I i can't complain too bad because i got my coffee and i'm sitting here talking to you about D, so you know things things could be worse yeah and you know yeah. you and i got to get some dinner last night we met up yeah. with one of our subscribers who has moved to our area yeah we went first got- pixelist meetup yeah, sort we of. Got dinner. We didn't get murdered. We didn't you know? get murdered. <laughs> so, um, but yes, we met. Uh, she goes by the handle Annie M in the Discord, and had an awesome time meeting her and her husband and her kid, and um, brought my kids along as well. And yeah, I thought it was a pretty fun. It was a fun yeah, get together. I I agree. They were fantastic. Shout out to Annie if she's watching. Um, like Blake said, didn't get murdered, and it was a very pleasant experience. <laughs> Um, and we just talk D and D naturally, you yeah. know, it's like, what do you, what do you talk about when you get together with, you know, people who watch your D and D channel? Apparently you just talk about more D and D. So we yeah. just talked about a role in D and D and it was awesome. Checks so, out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anywho. So, um, yeah, anytime any of you guys are in the Northwest Arkansas area, give us a ping and we'd be happy to grab a cup of coffee or just say hello or, um, I don't know. We're pretty, <laughs> We're pretty just like whatever, sure. Yeah, so, yeah. but um, two local men found in a ditch. <laughs> <laughs> two um, YouTubers. <laughs> so, what? Um, l- let's think about like what our announcements are today. We have the stream Friday, Worlds Beyond's tomorrow. We're not recording tomorrow for everyone listening. The next episode releases tomorrow. Yeah, it was delayed. Um, and like Will mentions many times, um, if you're not watching Worlds Beyond listening to worlds beyond uh highly recommend it it yep. is an incredible format one of my top things i look forward to um every couple of weeks um other than that any announcements i don't think anything out of the ordinary um other we got our discord watch party this thursday night for critical right. role um like always so be sure to join the discord if you haven't already uh but yeah that's that's pretty much it i think Okay. Well, uh, as is tradition, we like to do a little recap for what happened on our episode. And what we do is we pull that recap out as a separate episode. We post that on YouTube, and then we talk about the episode as a whole in a separate video. So if you're watching just the recap, in the description box, there is a link to um, see our full thoughts. And as always, we want to know what your thoughts were on this episode. This was a spicy episode. Lots of drama <laughs> around this episode. So a lot of, a lot of yeah. good stuff to talk about. Yeah. But Anywho, getting back to this combat that we left on in the previous episode, this is episode 93, Bittersweet Reunions, and essentially this episode opens up with Opal trying to negotiate with the Spider Queen, who's like, you know, I don't want to do this, like, do we have to do this? And the Spider Queen essentially says, because of, of, I think Opal says like, you know, I don't, you know, you, you need me more than I need you, and the Spider Queen's like, sure about that it's a very tim robinson (laughs) you sure about that (laughs) Uh, uh, but says the price has doubled so now you must kill two of them instead of one if you want the rest of them to live Uh, meanwhile morgan is attacking the spiders um she is able to resist getting poisoned by them um she prays to the matron of ravens and is like what the heck do i do and all she hears is the matron screaming run um, Dorian, meanwhile, casts Chromatic Orb, uh, and, uh, Abria has the Chromatic Orb not just hit the spider, but also hit Cyrus, who's pinned by the, the spider. Um, Fiorai is also talking to her god, the Wild Mother, 
And it's basically like, hey, I will commit myself to being your champion if you will just tell me what to do and more importantly, help me to figure out um, how to solve this. And I think Abria even asks something at, that's like along the lines of like, um, like asks her to, is, are you really making this commitment? And uh, Fear Rise kind of hesitant to really like say like, yes, I am. So she's trying to think about what to do. She also decides to cast Fireball on Opal or on this darkness, uh, but Opal counterspells it. Amy counterspells it. Without Abria offering, Amy's just like, ooh, counterspell, sorry. <laughs> I love you. Um, the turn is basically over. Fear is like, well, that was pretty much my biggest move. So finally she yells out, I accept your offer to the Wild Mother. And... Um, wants to become her champion. Uh, Opal goes next, and she casts Mass Suggestion at the sixth level. Dorian and Dariax both fail, and Opal tells them, go, walk away, go find Aurum. Uh, this spell lasts 24 hours, but if they take damage, they will be dispelled. Uh, Ted goes next, uh, and Abria describes Ted as like almost like a feral wolf, like a dog, a hungry dog trying to get loose and go after the party. Um, and Opal has to do a strength saving throw to essentially hold on to like the leash of Ted, uh, but has a natural one. She also has a, a minus one to strength, so it's basically a zero. Um, and so Ted goes forward, attacks Morgan, three attacks, a miss, a hit, and a natural 20 crit. She takes a ton of damage and she's poisoned. Um, then Opal goes next and seeing Ted having done this, she tries to cast Banishing Smite on Morgan, where if there's a successful hit, she can banish Morgan, who's essentially like on her last set of hit points. So she's trying to do like this mercy to Morgan to get them out, but misses hitting Morgan with only a roll of a 17. Uh, Dariax is going to cast Cure Wounds at the seventh level for himself, Morgan, uh, Dorian, and then gives a Bardic Inspiration to Fear Rai. And then following on with the mass suggestion is like, all right, see ya. I'm out here and like starts to like to climb off this little platform they're on and leave. Um, the spiders attack. One of them attacks Cyrus and downs him. Another attacks Fear Rai. Uh, another one hits and destroys one of these gemstones that are scattered. And Opal forgets in this moment. If you remember, these gemstones are like representative of her memories that Lolth wants Opal to forget. Um, this gemstone's destroyed and Opal in that moment forgets her true name, Georgina. Uh, and then another gets destroyed and she forgets the identity of Ted, who Ted even is. Then the spider queen goes and summons this big, like spider of nightmares <laughs> with like a big mouth. Um, it's like, uh, I think describes it as like, um, there's like the champion of the spider queen. And then there's like the next best thing. And that is what this thing is. It's this big evil spider. Um, there's a death save from Cyrus, um, at disadvantage, uh, fails. Um, there is, uh, then the spider queen is going to attack the downed Cyrus, kill Cyrus. Cause it's an automatic failure because of the attack. Um, Morgan goes, we get this amazing, I can't think of the actress's name, which I feel so bad about, but just an incredible, um, emotional moment from her because she had planned to save Cyrus, um, but essentially just goes nuts and kills one of these spiders as well. Dorian's Erica leaving. Lindbeck. Thank you. Erica Lindbeck. Dorian's leaving as well because of the mass suggestion. Uh, but as Dorian is leaving, he cast Gaius at the seventh level. We're getting a lot of Gaius across our D&D yeah. <laughs> our yeah. these days. <laughs> at the seventh level, and we get this awesome, just punchy moment where Dorian says, kill your mother for me. Um, the spider champion fails, uh, and then Dorian, Dorian leaves. Um, we also get a moment, by the way, where the Spider Queen is um, sort of mocked by this Gaia spell and basically says to Dorian, like, hey, it was supposed to be you. Like, you were supposed to be my champion, but you were too weak, uh, which is a great callback to some interactions in the original season of EXU. Um, moving right along, I know this is getting a little long-winded. Fear Rai goes next. She decides she wants to rip the crown off Opal's head and, and understands through an insight check that if she rips it off her head, it will kill Opal. Uh, and decides to instead do a persuasion check to convince the Spider Queen to let her come along and um, 
be like the protector of Opal uh, going forward. Um, she has, I think, an inspiration die and like a bardic inspiration. She has a lot of extra die. Um, yeah. She fails. Um, Abria says, you can continue this conversation, but it's going to cost you a pound of flesh. Uh, Furai says, I will not leave. Intimidation check with advantage. It's a 21, so she can say, stay. Uh, Dariax is seeing this conversation, and it, there's nothing you can do about it. just has to leave the battle map. Um, and then we get essentially the outro of Abria, this really sweet moment of all of these episodes. It's very much like breaking of the fellowship is kind of the vibe from Lord of the Rings. But yeah. Abria sort of like outroing like this group that came together in Amon, who now are going their separate ways. Um, Dariax and Dorian arrive in Zephra. Uh, Dariax asks Dorian, like, what are you going to do now? And Dorian's like, I've followed my brother my whole life. Like, I don't know what to do now. Um, does that make me a bad person? And Dariax says, no, like you, you can't be a bad person. Uh, then Dorian asks Dariax, what are you going to do? And he says, I don't, I don't know. I'm kind of scared. And Dariax, um, basically Dorian hands Dariax his loot because he's been training him to be a bard and tells Dariax, um, I want revenge. I want revenge for what's happened. And Dorian says, well, I don't know if I'm really ready for revenge. And Dariax kind of like sends him off into a crowd to like practice the loot. Uh, and then Dorian casts invisibility on himself, kind of smiles at Dariax and uh, subtly moves away, heads to the nearest temple, sees Keyleth arriving. Uh, and that is where we go to break. And that was the majority of the episode too. That's why it was so long. Yeah, good job, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, for the second half, we pick up with, you know, Dorian have having... Um, left Dariax uh, kind of subvertly and he's invisible and he can see Keyleth arriving into Zephra and he walks over to her and Keyleth, even though <clears throat> he's invisible, like knows he's there. So he drops his invisibility and she's like, Dorian, what are you doing here? And he says he's lost looking for guidance. He lost his group. He needs an anchor and he wants to continue what they started with all of this. And she asks what happened? And he tells her about his brother <clears throat> and basically just asks, um, do you think the Ashari, you could help retrieve his body? And Keela says, you are a great friend to Orem. Um, I, I can help you with that. And Dorian says he doesn't know where to go from here, but he just wants to see Orem and Fern again. And Keela says they're off on an important mission right now, but you know, you can stay here for now, get some rest, get yourself together. And she takes him <clears throat> to <clears throat> some private quarters and tells him just ask for anything that you need. And uh, she takes her leave and he can kind of hear her having like a serious discussion in the next room or upstairs or something to that effect. Um, and after briefly settling in, he gets a message from Orem, the same one that we saw Orem give back in episode 92, basically asking Dorian if he could come to Basarus, if he could make his way there, they really miss him and need him. And Dorian responds with just three words, I'll be there. Keyleth then knocks on his door, <clears throat> again tells him, you know, stay as long as you need, you know, we're here for you, and, um, but I'm about to leave. And so he asks where she's going, and she says, how much do you know about, like, everything going on right now? And he says he doesn't know much. So Keyleth gives him this very quick rundown about the ley lines and Ruidus and the God Eater and how Orem and the others have been helping with this, and, um... They, that's actually where she's going right now to where they are um, back in the Hellcatch Valley. And Dorian's like, well, can I come with you then? Keyleth is like, yeah, you know, as long as you know what you're getting into. And um, Dorian, of course, uh, wants to come along. So the two take their leave and she casts her tree stride to make them arrive in the Hellcatch Valley in this military encampment. And basically, as soon as they arrive, Dorian is just taking it all in and the gates of this encampment open up and he sees seven figures walking in it's bells hells except with no fcg and instead a small figure that he doesn't recognize so they of course immediately have this big warm reunion with Orem literally jumping into his arms and fern like bounding over and nearly nearly tackling him and um <clears throat> dorian says i'll tell you guys my story later but you know like what happened on Rudis. So Bell's Hells explained to Keyleth like what they ran into, what happened, what happened with FCG, and that his sacrifice is what saved all of them. 
And of course, about Eva Roa, who's most everybody's eyes are kind of looking toward as most of these people have never seen a Boromoto before. So they introduce Eva Roa to everyone. And, you know, she explains that she was a scientist working under Ludinus. And <clears throat> Bell's Hells basically continue to just catch up Keyleth on what they did. And they're like, hey, timetables are probably moving up after the chaos that we caused. And Keyleth says, hey, don't worry about that for now. Like you guys did a great job. You just need to rest. So <clears throat> the party then asks, um, well, what about the back door to Rudis that we found? And Keyleth says, yep, we're investigating it. We've got some Ashari over there that hopefully can maybe widen the portal to make it more useful. But she says, now you guys just need to rest. So she takes them to a large tent that has basically, it's like a sleeping quarters tent um, for all of them. And she says, I'm so glad you're here. And I'm so sorry for your loss with FCG. Um, but just rest up for now. I have some business to attend to. Uh, and she wild shapes into like a hawk and flies off. So <clears throat> it's at this point that we basically just have big old catch up time where Dorian is explaining everything that's happened to him since he last saw them, including specifically what just happened the day before with the crown keepers and his brother and the bells hells kind of explain, you know, two years of lore to Dorian, um, the, the, the major hits at least. And uh, this includes a little segment where Laudna gives Dorian the little um, dancer that she bought in the shop on Ruidus. And <laughs> he really appreciates that. And they make a joke about like, don't just give it away to a kid like you did with Chetney's, uh, <clears throat> Chetney's boat. Um, so after they catch each other up, Dorian basically asks, so what's the plan now? And they're really not sure. But Imogen says, are you going to be staying with us? And he says, yes. So at this point, Ashton goes and gets some liquor for everybody and he returns. They're having some drinks and um, Dorian's like, hey, what's up with your arm, man? So Ashton <laughs> tells him about the whole Titan shard thing and everything that went down with that. And he's like, are you OK? And Ashton's like, no. Um, but they cheers to reunions with old friends. Cheers to FCG and to Cyrus. And that's where the episode ends. Um, again, that was episode 93 bittersweet reunion and if you happen to just be on our recap and want to hear our full thoughts that will be linked down in the description below great job man good work thank you man it's easy easy compared to your half <laughs> i made sure i watched it fresh like the next day and like had the notepad up this time yeah i knew it was going to be a lot so <laughs> yeah um okay Let's talk about it. All right. <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> we would, you know, we mentioned we got together yesterday. Blake told me that he had some feeling some type of way about this episode. So he, he said to prepare. So um, oh. let's go, wanna, baby. Do we want to start there? <laughs> I mean, I feel like we might as well. Well, <clears throat> yeah, so, I don't want to. So we talked about the whole toxicity thing last yeah. time. And not, not, yeah. not that that's what you're about to do, but. I did. That was that was here again. This episode. I don't. You didn't watch live. I don't think. Did you? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. No. The Twitch chat, of course, was just complaining the whole first half. Um. Uh. But you know, we talked about that last time. But you know, just just yeah. getting this out of the way that that was still a large factor. So. Yeah, and I I haven't really been looking forward to this conversation in the sense <laughs> of um. You know, I love Critical Role. I really love Critical Role. Um, I love Abrio. I love Worlds Beyond. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be just like a negative talking head, but objectively speaking, I, I deeply disliked many things in this combat. Um, not from a Critical Role perspective, but from a D&D &D perspective, from a DM perspective. Um, there were some moments where I just was like, what? Um, and honestly, for how much, I guess I'll just start out with like a bold claim first yeah. for how much you and I have talked about. Um, it's annoying that people talk about this show being scripted and it's not, come on guys. It's not scripted. Yeah. Um, Cyrus's death felt absolutely scripted and not just scripted, but deeply forced, um, in this episode, and I thought it was too bad 
how it all went down in the sense of the people who like rage watch critical role mm. which we know there's people like that for whatever mm -hmm. reason of course um I, I feel like this was like a feather in their cap of like you know see um so that's my first that's my first of many things that i'm gonna say <laughs> uh, that's my first bolt claim and again we'll just i'm just doing a disclaim for everyone listening um, we always, you know, we like to say, you know, if you have a different opinions, it's okay. Uh, Will yeah. and I, we had some disagreement on, uh, Ashton, you know, Will didn't fully understand the Ashton <laughs> situation. <laughs> so we didn't see eye to eye and that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I think, I think we'll just generically say our issue. We don't have any issues with people disagreeing. It's just like the toxicity and like the character attachments, mm -hmm. like, you know, Matt's not a, Matt's a bad person, yeah. you know, or like things like that, that get really frankly weird um so right. we're gonna have a conversation that's you know not doing that but also sharing some opinions but anyway that's my first bold claim all right should we stop there yeah i think before that's before we move on yeah okay i so <clears throat> i'm not i don't disagree with that sentiment but i'm curious since you watched it more recently and you know took since did the recap on it can you remind me like which like parts specifically felt like Cause I don't remember like the nuance of yeah. the combat that like led were, to Cyrus going down. Yeah. There were, there were two things that really stood out to me that were strange to me. Three things. Actually, I realized one about 30 minutes ago as I was um, preparing for our session, I was like, Oh yeah. What, what happened with that? So first of all is chromatic orb. Um, chromatic orb is a single, it's, it's not an AOE spell. Um, you know, if you play in a D and D campaign and you have a um, uh, sorcerer, you're going to see chromatic orb every combat because it's just yeah. a really good, it's a really good spell. Um, anyway, so it's not an AOE, but Abria forcing it to also hit Cyrus was it felt unfairly punishing. Mm. Um, it felt like I was kind of as I watched it happen, I was like. Oh, okay. And yeah. I, it, it, here's also, and this is going to, I'll probably bring this up a few times. I think it just feels really bad when you're a player who makes a decision and you're punished for your decision because you didn't have all the information on the front end. Right. Yeah. Um, I agree. I think, I think if Dorian, if I had been DMing it, DMing it and I wanted to make that an option, I would have said, Dorian, that's an awesome spell. Here's what I'll do. If you can roll above X, I will give you a crit, like an 18. But if you roll lower than a blank, I'm going to have it hit Cyrus. Do you still want, do you want to take that gamble? Mm. So I give it back to the player and the player has the agency then to like, okay, how much do I want to lean into it? Yeah. But here's Dorian trying to make what he thinks is the right decision. And Abria twisted it into, yep, and you just damaged, you just damaged your brother, yeah. which you know, this story has been going on for a few years. So who knows like how meaningful the NPC is <clears throat> to Robbie Damon. But for that, that was the central character for his story. Um, it just, it just felt unfairly punishing and it, it, I would not have liked that as a player. Um, so that's, that was the first one. Yeah. The other one that um, I didn't like was I don't understand why he had to make death saves at death saves at disadvantage because he there was a death save and Abria said dorian do you want to roll it or do you want me to roll it and dorian was like well i'll roll it because it's my brother and she goes okay with disadvantage and i didn't know if she was like well because it's you it's disadvantage or if she was yeah. always going to do it at disadvantage but i and, and maybe i'm i may have missed something by the way like i I've only been DMing for a few years, so maybe there's a detail I missed. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand why it was at disadvantage other than yeah. just to be just to be more punitive is yeah. how it felt. Um, and then the last thing regarding it being scripted was I was surprised that with two bards and a paladin that no one had revivify for Cyrus. Which maybe they just didn't. I don't have I don't have it. That's like the weakest complaint I have. Um, but I thought, okay, you're all level 14, level 13. Yeah. Um, surely someone has Revivify, right? So I was surprised that that never got casted. And it almost made me feel like when Morgan was like, oh, I was going to do something. I was like, well, you're a paladin. I mean, you probably have Revivify, so you still could do something. But then I was kind of like, well, maybe they, and I'm not, 
I'm not trying to say like go from ditch to ditch, like everything's scripted, but like mm-hmm. we know that Robbie was supposed to come back. We know his brother was the reason he left. His brother being out of the picture is a pretty neat, you know, tie in to get him back. Um, but anyway, so that's that's all under the banner. The <laughs> end yeah. of my essay on it felt too scripted. <clears throat> um, so we can go any direction you want to on that. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I, you know, I think that's fair. Um, the, the chromatic orb thing, I definitely agree with you on like that. Um, the revivify and the disadvantage, I think that, you know, that kind of is what it is. Like, you know, we we knew FCG didn't even take revivify and had to True. make yeah. that table side deal with Matt to, to get access to it. So I could easily totally. believe that they just didn't have it. Totally. Um, and then maybe there was a reason for the disadvantage we don't know about, but the chromatic orb totally, I agree with that. Like, it's, it's punishing a player when they didn't even like, know, you know, like that he should have had yeah. a, a slightly more, more agency in that, I think. Um, <clears throat> but okay. I don't, it's funny. Cause we even talked about this scripted thing, uh, last night with, uh, Annie with, and her husband, but, um, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> we gotta like get into the semantics of what we mean when we say scripted, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think that's fair. <clears throat> So I, I definitely think that, especially because of how Abria like hyped up this episode and also just how she was speaking during it. Literally, she said, like, I thought I would kill more of you. Like, she clearly was coming into this with, like, it's going to be a massacre. So, like, in the sense that it was scripted and that, like, she, I think, was trying to get bodies at 100%. And maybe even Cyrus was like, no matter what, like, I'm taking him out. I could see that mindset and then maybe like things like the chromatic orb, things like the disadvantage where her just like kind of making sure that happens and it's kind of sloppy for lack of a better word. Um, But I don't, here's what I don't think. I don't think Robbie went into that battle knowing his brother was going to die. If that makes sense. I don't, I don't know if I agree. Um. I'm not, I'm not saying, I, and I'm not overtly saying I disagree. I, I could see it both ways. Like Matt said in the outro, like, hey, we wanted to get you back sooner, but, you know, it didn't. The plan, the plan was to always bring you back sooner, which I was like, of course, we love Robbie, yeah. you know? So, but I, I frankly feel like there could have been a conversation. I'm like, yeah, we're going to, and maybe it wasn't like as, I don't think it was like as, I think the, I love you, you mentioned like semantics. I think the people who talk about scripted, like they think there's like a table read that happens right, right. for the episode. Like I'm going to say this, you're going to say that we're going to, I don't think, I think it's ludicrous for that to happen. Um, I feel like it's within the realm of possibility that there was a high level conversation on, um, Hey, we're going to bring you back. And you know, there's going to be this storyline of Cyrus having been killed, you know, and maybe it was as generic as that, or maybe not though. I, I think, like I said, I'm not I'm not disagreeing fully because I think it's totally fair that, you know, hey, we're bringing you back, but we don't want to spoil it. So, you know, just know that, you know, and then Matt's charge to Brie was Cyrus must die. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess, I guess <clears throat> it's, it's probably unfair to use the word scripted because it has so much negative connotation with it. Mm-hmm. I think I think the way you said it was probably a lot better of like Abria came into it with like a certain intent Mm-hmm. and was um, very uh, diligent on making sure that that happened, um, whether Robbie was in the know or not. Yeah, I I just don't think Robbie would need to be in the know, and I think it makes it worse if he was. Like, that's like, it, it, we've had the conversation of is it a show or is it their game, but even aside from that conversation, like, and I know Abria was in the DM chair, not Matt, but this is still critical role at the end of the day. Like, I think they want Robbie to have that organic experience to like, so mm-hmm. I, I just don't think, I don't think that would have been like on the whiteboard before the session. Like Cyrus ain't making it out of this because I also think that you could have, I think Dorian can still join the party. If Cyrus is alive, like it's D and D like it, you know, could have just been like, mm-hmm. Hey Cyrus, like things are getting real. Like, you know, his connection with Orem and Fern, like they need me. I need to do this. Go back and talk to mom and dad, tell them what's going on. Like one of us needs to make sure to be safe. Like, I think, 
I think they easily could have had everything happen the same if Cyrus lived. So in that way, I don't think like that was like a thing that had to happen and was scripted. But again, I think in Abria's mind, she was like, I'm getting some bodies here. And so maybe Cyrus was, especially being an NPC, the easiest to make sure that happens. Um, mm. So I, I, I agree with you, but I guess just like getting into the nuance of it, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, in my mind, which I don't know, I, I don't think they went into that knowing for sure that anyone was going to die. But again, Abria probably really wanted to make a cool session, memorable moment and give a good reason for the party to split. Like, I think she went into it absolutely knowing that, like, I have to break up the crown keepers. Like, obviously, Amy Carrero is going to be sent in this one direction. Like, I don't think it was probably scripted in so far as like they couldn't save Amy. Yeah. Opal. I should say Opal, yeah. not Amy. Um, that's fair because yeah. their insight checks and like religion communes. I shouldn't use it because they didn't actually cast that. But basically the other gods being like, get out. Yeah, like, like run. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> So I, yeah, so I, I, I think I agree with you ultimately, but I just would, I'm probably further on the unscripted side than you. Yeah. But like that, really? especially that chromatic orb moment, like I totally agree with you there. Like there, I feel like there could have been a better way to do that without stripping your player of agency to do it. Yeah. And I think, I think the other issue I had is, um, and I think some of the nuance that people are losing also is how the role of the DM has changed over the additions. Um, I didn't play, I think, I think maybe Oath Raven or one of our subs was, I think we were talking about this recently. Um, some of our, our discord players are much savvier than I am and much longer, um, just much more experienced. Um, I never played third edition, but from what I've been told is that the role of the DM back then was, in general, more adversarial and more like, I am like, you know, the person creating the obstacles and like to win at D and D is to beat the DM. Um, it's not how I like D and D you and I have been in a campaign where we had a DM who was very open and honest about having that ideology. Um, and I found myself in situations like Dorian did many times where I would try to do something and it would either be punishing or it would fail or I didn't have the whole picture. And I was just like, okay, this isn't really fun. Um, point that I'm getting at though was I think the nuance of a Bria style is I don't know how long she's been playing. Um, if she's been playing as long as third edition, I think we saw that style outside of that nuance. Her style felt very standoffish to me. Um, very standoffish. It felt, it did not feel collaborative. Um, specifically when Cyrus died, which could have been like a really meaningful moment for the player. Um, she seemed kind of like nonchalant and giddy, like talking to Matt, like, oh, so he's dead now, right? Okay, yep, yeah, he's dead. Which this was like, I don't know, like for me, if I was like, that's one of my players, like, you know, and now Morgan had this amazing moment after the fact. So, I mean, it, it's fine. But um, there was also a moment later, I don't remember what the spell was, but Robbie was like asking like, what's the rule? And Abria was like, you know, the rule is like whatever the F I say it is or something. And Robbie was like, well, I wasn't questioning you. Like kind of sheep, I mean, I don't want to force any emotions there, but I was kind of cringing of like, oh, like I just very like, I don't know. It, the The tension was a little bit there for me and I don't want to over analyze this. And we said earlier, I don't want to make any like character assumptions about a Um, I'll just say that style that I saw in this episode, which I feel like I didn't see that much of in EXU that style. If it was me playing at a table, I would probably quit the table. Just being totally honest. I'd be like, yeah, it's not, it's not really for me, but, um, I I get what you're saying. Um, totally. Uh, but I, I think that was a product of what needed to happen in that session, because like you said, she was not Bria's deeming isn't like that always, you know? Right. Um, so I think <clears throat> trying to decide if I want to invoke this comparison or not, because I, I know, and I'm not, I don't disagree with, I, I I'm, like, getting, I'm getting ahead of myself, but like, I would kind of, 
surprised once. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? No, I would, I would kind of compare it to how Brennan had to operate in calamity a bit with like, you kind of knew that things were, were going to hit the fan. And I think that I'm not saying that <clears throat> the way Bria handed it was, was perfect and the best way to do it. But I think you are coming into a different mindset with this session, because again, like bodies need to hit the floor. We need to splinter this party. So I think she was coming on in, you know, what's that Spider-Man mode, like instant kill mode or whatever from his, Mm -hmm. his suit. Like, I think that's Mm -hmm. what she came in. in. And so I think that was like the influence you're feeling in those ways. And I'm not saying you're wrong to feel the way you felt about it, but I just don't think it speaks to her DMing as a whole. Yeah, and like well, sense. like I said, we've we've seen EXU, and like I yeah. I didn't necessarily feel any of that from then, um, so it was a bit surprising and off putting for me. Um, yeah, I don't I don't want to, and not that you were going there, but I don't like I feel like I have more to say, but it's like not my place to say it because I I feel like if we look at the meta of things, and especially especially how Abria specifically has been treated by like the internet as a whole, like surrounding these types of things. I, I can imagine like the mindset you need to come into when you know, like you're going to have to kill players potentially and stuff and just mm-hmm. like the noise that's going to be created from that. Like you probably kind of right. have to be like, yeah, singularly focused and just block it all out and be like, time to get my hands dirty. So, you know, well, it's also like a very, yeah, it's a very intense position to be in. Yeah. Um, you know, I think getting over to the topic of like tos- toxicity, um, I don't even want to say that critters on Reddit have a high standard. I think it's more critters are never happy on Reddit. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's a hard position to come in where, you know, I know when Erica Ishii was in the campaign earlier as you, uh, there was a lot of like really weird criticism, criticism on like, like she's trying too hard. There's, yeah. there's she's bringing too much energy to the, t- like just, just some weird things said. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of a shame because seeing, I haven't watched much Dimension 20, but seeing her in uh, Worlds Beyond, I'm like, yeah. this person's a genius. This person's yeah. awesome. So so I recognize like the mantle of responsibility is um, enormous. And that's why for me, I kind of just chalk it up to like, yeah, it's it's not for me. And it just is what it is rather than anything else beyond that. Because, you know, if I was in that seat, um, it would be bad. <laughs> so, yeah, seriously. Like he, has, same. he has two accents that he keeps going back to. <laughs> Is this the same uh, NPC? Yeah. Did he teleport here? So I um, had a, uh, in my campaign last night. So like five sessions ago, there was like this like 19 or 20 year old young soldier named Robbie. And they came into another soldier who was young his name was Doug because I couldn't think of a name. I was like, Doug. <laughs> well, I kept accidentally calling him Robbie. <laughs> and they were like, like, all right, so next session, are we meeting another guy? Who's <laughs> I was like, we're just going to have Robbie's all the way through this. <laughs> through the campaign, it's like so. Pokemon where every Pokemon center is the same nurse joy or not the same yeah. one, but they're all nurse joy. No, right? Yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's about all I have to say about the first half in terms of like, I've really nothing else to add, but yeah, no, I mean, and I, I think those are valid criticisms. Um, so, you know, I've said my piece as well. I thought this was just one. I thought we were parking there and there was much more to, to come though on the first half or we really, we hit it all. No, I I do want to talk about high notes. Um, I loved, man, it's, it's, it was very, um, it hit me in the feels as a Bria kind of outroed the party. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just thought it just reminded me of those first episodes of EXU for me watching it with my wife who had never seen Critical Role, um, going to buy Rodin, the pies, yeah. you know, the talent competition, like all these like sweet memories yeah. with these players. And um, it very much was like breaking of the fellowship. It just felt um, it was very raw. Um, so that was tough and like just a cool moment. And then Morgan, um, her, um, when she says like the final thing to Opal before she leaves of where she says like, um, you can always come back like that. That was a very hard moment for me. And yeah. I just thought, 
I was like, dude, get this person back on Critical Role, please, <laughs> because just what an incredible heartfelt yeah. moment. <clears throat> um, anyway, so I really, I loved both of those parts. Yeah, there were some some great RP, especially toward the end there. Um, like Dariax not knowing what happened to Cyrus was a gut mm -hmm. punch. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, fantastic. And yeah, Abria kind of, it, it was very reminiscent of like a Matt speech at the end of a campaign after it's over. Um, <clears throat> but which is always very bittersweet, but this one like was more bitter because of the chaos and fracturing that had just happened. Um, but yeah, I was right there with you because it, it, I mean, could we see the crown keepers get some sort of resolution down the road? Like maybe, but the way like Abria basically bookended their story with that moment. Um, and think about the moment of Morgan as the champion of the matron of Ravens with like Cyrus apparating by her as she was leaving and Abria drawing the connection of, you know, your job is to ferry souls. Yeah. Like I was just like, Oh man, what a moment to yeah. like, sometimes you see that little glimmer of an opportunity as a DM and you seize it. And it's just like such a beautiful moment. Yeah. So, so good. Um, getting in my feels just talking about this, man. Yeah. A lot of good moments. Um, so I think it is very, I think what you said, like it being more bitter is true in that it's, you know, it's like, it's not, there's some real um, allusions to Xerxes in a way of we're seeing this transformation of um, fairly naive character. And, um, you know, it's kind of a tragedy of what's happened to Opal. And uh, I guess, yeah, if nothing else, she has Fear I at her side. So, yeah, I, and that's just, that's interesting to me, that whole dynamic, because, you know, the gods are looking out for themselves, which is kind of the whole reason this went down. The Spider Queen won her champion. And now where things ended, the Wild Mother's champion is, is right there with her. So one, betrayers working with normal gods, but that's not new. We kind of already know that that was what was taking place. Um, but what I thought was really interesting is that the Raven Queen kind of was separate from that. And I don't know how, like, I don't know how, if that should be read into very much, because it could just be a product of like what needed to happen with the character dynamics there, where Morgan needed to not go with those other two. Um, but it also, if we do read into it, is interesting considering that the Matron of Ravens you know, was a mortal that ascended. So like, maybe she's not really with the crew as far as the other gods are concerned. But I did just think it was interesting that the wild mother who typically is like this really, you know, good God was like, yep, going with the spider queen. And the Raven queen was like, no, you guys need to run. Like, let's get out of here. So. Yeah. I think it, either Bria said something overtly, or there was some interesting implication about the matron who, I think it was like, Morgan like heard the word sister like Loth is her sister or the spider queen is her sister and there was some like dialogue from Abria about the matron having to like own that like although she wasn't didn't start that way like this is yeah. now um so I I noticed that too of like this interesting seems like this interesting nuance of um you know as it's presented Pradathos being free is supposed to as Lutonus frames it should help all mortals at the expense of the gods. Mm -hmm. um, so the matron is interestingly in this middle, I wouldn't say middle, I mean, 80, 20, you know, <laughs> help the brothers, brothers and sisters. But um, yeah, that hesitation, I noticed that too. That was interesting. Yeah. So I'm just, and you know, the matron has been like a central part of not like a central, I guess, but like very much on the map for this whole campaign in the connection mm -hmm. with lewdness. Um, what it, we still don't really know what that is. Um, I mean, it's probably, I mean, we know probably know the parallels and connections, but we still don't have like a definitive answer to why he was so obsessed with her. Um, and then of course, Vax and that whole element, but I'm just curious to see how this, how that dynamic evolves. But at the end of the day, I probably just imagine to, her to be on the same side as the gods, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, just thought thought yeah. that was interesting. Um, I loved the flavor of the Gaius spell. Yeah, just like a Robbie has so many great lines in this episode. 
with the kill your mother for me it was like yeah. such a, a nice so little good. jab at the end um uh, anything else from this combat um i don't think so okay well so dorian and Darax head to zephra um dorian sends Darax on his way yeah uh, that was sad I, I was sad you know they've they're like brothers you know yeah. so i i did have like the slight like could we see Darax at the table as matt and like Abria continues on or like you know a different dm comes in like not for the end of the campaign but i just thought that yeah. would be really interesting for the party to have matt at the table with them but um it made sense to send him on um but still sad yeah so it's like sam and uh frodo you know separating felt like yeah but so. the worst and i get i get why he did it but the worst part is is he just left you know he didn't even like mm -hmm. tell him so poor Dariax, man. Derek's is gonna become the BBEG for yeah. <laughs> the way he was treated by Dorian. But hopefully he can meet up with um Denise. I was actually Denise. wondering if like not that it would have been a big moment or anything, but just because Amy also happened to be there, if there was be like a tiny moment where like we saw a reunion yeah. or anything, but yeah, you know, maybe maybe yeah. we'll get some info on that in the campaign wrap up or something. So Robbie's back at the table, which we wanted. We didn't want it, you know, three years later, but yes. we got it nonetheless. Um, and I, it, it, this seems like he will be finishing the campaign with the group. That's what it felt like, kind of. I mean, who knows? But it did feel like that kind of tongue in cheek a little bit with like Imogen asking, like, are you here to stay? Um, so, I mean, that's my hope and my assumption, I guess, is that he's he's back for the rest. Um, but again, I mean, who knows how much longer this campaign is? So if, yeah. if you know, I, I would guess that he's probably here for most of the rest, if, if not all. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. I feel the same way. It's good to have him back. He, it's going to be interesting. Cause I've, <clears throat> it's been so long. I remember just being so enamored by him, but it's been, you know, a while. Um, so I'm excited to kind of like relearn like his presence at the table. Yeah. Like, kind of get the new dynamic. Um, yeah. Which, cause it's crazy. Cause since he started the campaign and everyone loved him, he felt like one of the main crew. And I mean, he is, but I think when you go back, he wasn't in that many episodes, honestly, like it was like 15 yeah. maybe. Yeah. Like, I think so he left around then. Yeah. And so now we're almost at a hundred. So he was in like basically 10%, a little more. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's crazy. So it's going to be interesting to, it, <laughs> And this is just like a weird thing with time, but it also felt like an instant kind of in my yeah. mind. Like he just yeah. left and he's back, you know, even though it's been two years or whatever. Um, right. Right. So I'm really interested to see the dynamic. And what's crazy is there's that dynamic being re-injected into the group. And then presumably we're going to have Sam Regal as a brand new character also coming in. So I'm just really excited to see how all that shapes Maybe. up. I mean, he joked, see you in campaign four. So it would yeah, be wild I, if we just didn't see him again. He's coming back. He's coming <laughs> back. But I do think there's room for like some some interesting angles here because like I don't wanna mm, I just think because it's so late in the campaign and like the the general circumstances of it being this really big planet like Pradathos is such like a high level threat that we have characters from campaign one and two showing up i do think there's like a weird chance for there to be like something sam maybe wouldn't normally do like i'm not saying he'd come back to play a previous campaign character necessarily but like Scamlin there's less joins the, joins the there's party. less like like you could do something crazy because you're in the final stretch of the campaign like you know you don't necessarily have to make like the main pc that needs to like have the same journey over 120 right. episodes, like a normal, like new character would have to what do. do. You, and like, what do you mean exactly? Do you mean like a famous NPC, like him joining as that? Or do you mean like just a crazy, like a crazy backstory, like an evil character who like yeah. the enemy of my enemy is my friend and like joins the party or kind of like all of the above. Like, I don't want to specifically yeah. say like he's coming back as, you know, uh, 
Veth or, or some or Scanlan or Veth or something like that. Yeah. But I do think that is like where I would say in normal circumstances that would never happen. I feel like there's a slight chance of something like that happening given the circumstances. Yeah. So whether that is like a previous character or like a character from a one shot or maybe like coming as one of, you know, uh, I mean, this isn't really a spoiler. like one of the previous campaigns kids or something, uh, you know, like just something yeah. kind of weird like that because there's not as much pressure and there is like so little, so little time left. Uh, yeah. Plus it's Sam Regal. So I just yeah. could see him capitalizing on this chance to do something even weirder than normal, whatever yeah. shape that takes. Yeah. I like the idea of like all rules are off or is that the expression? All rules are <laughs> all off. All bets are off. I think all bets are off. <laughs> you really say, There's no rules. rules. <laughs> <laughs> we could do whatever we want. Matt's like, no, you have to follow the rules. Uh, <laughs> I crit him. I don't have to roll. <laughs> Easy. I think I'd say about the guy I played with who he was like, yeah, I played a lot of D and D. I was like, okay, and we started playing together, and he was like, all right, I'm gonna attack that guy, and I was like, okay, and he's like, I hit him, and I was like, well, you have to roll. <laughs> he was like, what? No, I hit him. <laughs> it's like you said you've played a lot of D and D, so flirting that can just be that can mean anything, really. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, I love the idea that all bets are off in that. Um, I do like with Dorian coming back. I the party can do whatever they want. And I think some people like over min max D and D of like, well, we have this, we need to have that. We need, and there's nothing wrong with that, but also a good DM is going to within reason design future right. stuff around the party's dynamic. Um, not to say that the parties can't make it harder on themselves for sure. But I was thinking we really need, we need something supportive for this party with FCG gone. Now that Dorian's in, I'm like, yeah, it could yeah. be anything. So. Yeah. Agreed. Um, I can't wait to see what it is. And I, I don't know if I expect it to be that tomorrow's episode, but I do think probably soon. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll see Sam's new character. Do we think Aor is what's next? It feels like the or, most, that's it. Uh, Eisel cross, I guess is a better way to put it. Yeah. But same. Yeah. Um, yeah. it feels like the most obvious thing. Like if, if what's next is something we're aware of, then it feels like it's a, or, but I could, you know, who knows what like curveball Matt could throw at him. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it does seem like with Eva Roa and all of like the lore drop that's surrounding that, not to mention just like the general intrigue on a metal. Why level. is it? Why isn't Eva Roa? And maybe the party like lost this detail, but what, weren't they originally told that Everoa was working on a weapon for Ludinus? Like in like the prompt of the mission, but like no one's asked. I mean, they kind of did ask like what, tell me about like Ludinus, but like there wasn't like a direct like, hey, so what are you making? Yeah. Which it could be the party just forgot or just, you know, the narrative kind of shifted a little bit, but is, is there still more to glean from Everoa that they haven't yet? I think probably, but I don't know if this is what you're talking about or not, because I don't specifically remember the weapon comment, but I, I we did learn that the devices from Aeor that they were harvesting, that's what Everoa was working on, adding right. their technology to those devices, which Correct, I yeah. thought was to get through the glass. Right. So that was the connection I had made. But do you are you saying you think there's something else that was like a weapon that was mentioned, or I could think, that be that? No, that could, that could totally be it. I think I think I was so um, we've talked this dialogue of like why doesn't Ludinus have the harness anymore? So he must have something else, presumably maybe to consume the vessel and become Predathos or what have you. So I was. I just assumed there was like an object, like a singular object. And that was kind of what yeah. I was waiting on to be revealed. Um, but I also don't know. Um, I don't like, you know, every NPC is suspicious, obviously. But yeah. I'm also a bit curious about Everoa in the sense of. Not that Everoa is a spy, but I do just wonder, like, you know, in a. Um, Stranger Things, I think it was season two, where the poor kid who's always like, you know, 
taken advantage of by the bad guys. <laughs> like they're seeing they're seeing everything through that kid. Yeah. Um, part of me also wonders like is there a level of unreliability to Evaroa that we haven't that like Matt's waiting to reveal? Yeah. Um, or maybe not. Could just be you know. I mean, Evero was a spy, but just supposedly True. for the good guys. Right. Um, right. I, I feel like there could be another shoe to drop with Evero, but n I I wouldn't think it would be like a secretly she's a spy for lewdness angle. But yeah, maybe like, like like mustache twirling, but more like unbeknownst to her. Yeah, because they they found her in a test tube, right? Like they yeah. were experimenting on her in some form or something. Um, We're going to go through with this. So just go ahead and get into this tube. <laughs> yeah. Wait, did we, I can't remember. Did we like, I feel like an answer was given for that, but now I don't know if I'm just, I created I the answer for that. And it wasn't there was an answer given to that. That's kind of my point is like, so it wasn't said that they found out she or... was a spy and that was like punishment. I, I made that up. I think it was implied. I don't okay. think there was. I don't think we ever broke down like the specifics of like, what were they doing to you? Yeah. Which, and that may be like a total non point anyway. It may not even ever matter, but yeah, but I could see, I could see something in that regard. Um, I mean, if they do go to AOR, I wonder if they would bring her with them or if it would just be like, tell us what you know, and we're going to go. They probably wouldn't bring her. I don't know. I see both. Like I could see it being like, Hey, if we're going to be encountering some of these things that are getting brought from AOR, it might be good to have you. Mm -hmm. But then also like you're on our planet for the first time ever. Yeah. Like there's, it probably leads to more questions and like parenting you than. Yeah. Plus, I mean, I know. imagine she's like a level one, like. Yeah. She's a scientist. So would not survive like a single hit type of person. I yeah. Bet, so, <laughs> um, but so, yeah, especially yeah. with that, the, the Dominox mention and just, it, it seems to me that that's the most likely place the story is going to go. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. Okay. We'll see other, other things. Um, I know the majority was that combat. But. Yeah, not really. I mean, I'm just, I'm excited. Um, they, they gave each other the, the, the brief recap, you know, like Dorian yeah. filled them in and they hit the high notes, but I'm excited for more of like a settling into some of those conversations. Like I hope we get some, especially of course, between Orem and Dorian. Um, so I'm looking forward to those interactions and not that, not that it relates to anything specifically, but I'm, I think I might be most excited for more Chetney Dorian. Cause I loved their dynamic back in the original where like Chetney was like hated him at first, but then, you know, really softened up. And um, I just specifically remember, I think, was it like the mirror tower or something early on in the campaign? Something like that. I don't can't remember what it was called. Oh. But, um, I just remember them. They were like patrolling around and I don't know if he like held his hand or something, but like yeah. Chetney, like really <laughs> opened up to Dorian and was like, thanks yeah. for being my friend or something. So I don't know. I'm just really looking forward to, to those two bouncing off each other again. It's interesting that Dorian took Sam's, uh, Robbie took Sam's seat and didn't take his original seat from the start of the campaign. That's not really that interesting. I didn't even. But I, didn't even I didn't even put the. I didn't even think, think about that. Um, it'd be interesting to see what if that remains the case when Sam comes back. Yeah. yeah. Are they still in? Because you know, remember they swapped their seating arrangement when they did the two missions. Um, yeah. Like, um, did they go back to normal, or are they still in that mission arrangement? I can't remember. I think they're back to normal. I think. Okay. Yeah, I think they're back to normal. Just with Robbie and Sam's seat. Where was Robbie uh, originally? Was he still he was was he, he was top row? Between, yeah, he was right next to Travis. Um it was Travis Dorian, uh Travis Dorian. Travis Marisha, Robbie, Sam. Marisha, Sam. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So okay. okay. Well, uh, let us know what you guys thought about the episode yep. and we'll have our watch party tomorrow night. It'll be in our discord channel. So you can definitely join that and join us for that discussion as we watch. Um, we'll have our live stream Friday at one o'clock central time. And um, we'll probably our next content piece will be uh, likely our deep dive on this episode that's coming up. Yeah. Um, and then worlds beyond a little after that.
So. All righty. Bada boom, bada bing. <laughs> All righty, yeah. y'all. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye.